Welcome back to lecture four of week five. We pick up where we left off last time with Lim Soup and Lim Inf. This lecture will focus on the reason why we emphasize these two concepts. They tell us something about whether a sequence converges. By itself, this theorem is not terribly useful. In situations where the limb soup and limb inf can be explicitly computed to make use of this theorem, the sequence can usually be easily determined to be convergent or divergent. However, <clears throat> as an abstract theorem, this will figure into our discussion of the Cauchy criterion, with which we will finish this week. Without further ado, the theorem. It says that a sequence converges if and only if, so this is a by implication, the sequence is bounded and its limb soup and its limb inf are equal. <clears throat> if we return to the examples that we did in the previous lecture, we see that this agrees with the examples we have seen. For example, the sequence with x sub n equaling 1 over n converges, and we saw indeed that the limb soup and limb inf both equal. Um, zero in that uh, in that case and the sequence with x sub n equaling sine of m pi over 3 does not converge and we saw that the limb soup is positive root 3 over 2 and the limb inf is negative root 3 over 2 and they are not equal The theorem further exerts that when the condition is satisfied, we must have that the limit of the sequence is exactly equal to the limb soup of the sequence, which is also exactly equal to the limb inf of the sequence. The sequence is generally more useful in the reverse direction. It tells us that if we can somehow prove that the limb soup and limb inf of a sequence must be the same, then we can conclude that the sequence is convergent. Let's prove the theorem. First, we prove that if the limit exists, then both limb soup and limb inf are equal to the limit. The fact that if the limit exists, the sequence is bounded is theorem 33 from week 4. Before showing the proof, let's think about how the proof should go. We know that a definitional convergence for a sequence tells us that for any epsilon, if we wait long enough, the remainder of the sequence will remain within epsilon of the limit. Comparing definitions, this should mean that any value that is more than epsilon away from the limit has to be either an eventual upper bound if it is greater than the limit, or an eventual lower bound if it is smaller than the limit. Since epsilon is arbitrary, this should tell us by using the Archimedean property that any number larger than the limit is an eventual upper bound, and any number smaller than the limit is an eventual lower bound. And this should basically tell us that the infimum of the eventual upper bound, or the limb soup of the sequence, is equal to the limit, and similarly for limb inf. Now, let's try to write this out rigorously. For convenience, we will use z to denote the limit of the sequence, which we assume converges. In the first part of the proof, we will show that for any positive epsilon, z plus epsilon must be an eventual upper bound, and z, plus, uh, and z minus epsilon must be an eventual lower bound. From the definition of limits, we see that for any positive epsilon, we can find a capital N such that for any later index, the distance of z to x sub n is no more than epsilon. Expanding the inequality and doing some arithmetic, we find that uh, the final clause is the same as saying that for any index n greater than capital N, we can pinch x sub n between z minus epsilon and z plus epsilon. So this very same capital N can be used as what is required in the definition of eventual upper and lower bounds to show that Z plus epsilon is an eventual upper bound, namely that for any index later than this capital N, X sub N is less than or equal to Z plus epsilon, 
and to show that z minus epsilon is an eventual lower bound. In this second part of the proof, we will use the information we found about eventual upper and lower bounds to compute the limb sup and limb inf using their definitions. Based on the previous slide, we found that z plus anything positive gives you an eventual upper bound, and that z minus anything positive gives you an eventual lower bound, so that the limb sup of the sequence being the infimum of all eventual upper bounds has to be no more than the infimum of the set of numbers that are greater than z, which turns out to be z, and the limb inf of the sequence being the supremum of all eventual lower bounds has to be no less than the supremum of the set of numbers that are less than z. On the other hand, from what we did in the third lecture of this week, we know that the limb sup of a sequence has to be at least the limb inf of the sequence. So chaining together steps 2 and 3, we have that z is no more than the limb inf of the sequence, which is no more than the limb sup of the sequence, which is no more than z again. Since the beginning and the end of this chain are equal, um, the whole chain collapses into a big chain of equalities, proving what we want. Next, we can prove the reverse implication that if a sequence is bounded and has its limb sup and limb inf equal to each other, then the sequence converges. For convenience, we will again use z, but now to denote the common value shared by limb sup and limb inf. Before launching into the proof, let's again talk through how this proof should go. The fact that z is the limb sup should tell us that it is, roughly speaking, the lower boundary for the set of all eventual upper bounds. Similarly, z being the limb inf should tell us that it is the upper boundary of the set of all eventual lower bounds. So z plus epsilon and z minus epsilon will be an eventual upper and eventual lower bound respectively. So in particular, if we wait long enough, this should mean that a sequence should be clamped between z plus epsilon and z minus epsilon. And this is precisely the statement that the sequence converges to z as epsilon should be arbitrary. Now, let's make this precise. Steps 1 through 3, we show that given any epsilon positive, there is some n sub u, such that whenever the index is greater than n sub u, the term x sub n is no more than z plus epsilon. This is due to z being the infimum of all eventual upper bounds. And so since z plus epsilon is greater than z, we can find the eventual upper bound that is less than z plus epsilon. The definition of eventual upper bound make available to us the n sub u in respect to which any later index will give a term x sub n that is no more than this eventual upper bound. Since this eventual upper bound is below z plus epsilon, this means that for the same n sub u, any greater index will give a term x sub n that is strictly less than z plus epsilon. Repeating the same argument but flipping all the signs, we end up with a similar statement that there exists some n sub l such that any greater index will give a term x sub n that is strictly larger than z minus epsilon. Combining the two, we see that if we go far enough beyond both n sub u and n sub l, the distance between x sub n to z cannot be greater than epsilon. The fact that we can find this threshold index capital N for any positive epsilon is exactly what we need for showing that the sequence converges to, uh, to Z. All right, that's it for this lecture. Next lecture, we will finish this week by talking about the Cauchy criterion.